Five Mysterious Unsolved Cases, Part 3. On August 29, 2016, an Australian family of five decided to go on a technology-free, off-the-grid road trip, convinced that they were being pursued and needed to escape their home. For reasons unknown, married couple Mark and Jacoba Trump were convinced that someone was out to rob and kill them and believed that they had to flee their red current farm. They took with them their three adult children, aged 22, 25, and 29, and drove away in their gray Peugeot station wagon. They left their passports, credit cards, and cell phones behind, and when they discovered that their son Mitchell had brought a phone along on the trip, they made him throw it out the window as they were convinced it was being used as a tracking device. Each member of the family, over the course of six days, was found one by one. Mitchell was the first to leave the group after traveling all night with his family at around 7 a.m. the next morning, he left the car as he was not convinced by the paranoid theories of the rest. Later that day, the two daughters of the group, Rihanna and Ella, also left their parents and stole a car and drove to the town of Goulburn, where they reported their parents as missing. The two sisters then decided to part ways as Ella wanted to go home and feed her horses, and Rihanna did not. Police found Ella once she arrived back at the family home. Shortly after, Mitchell also arrived back at the home. Rihanna was the last of the children to be discovered. She was mysteriously found in a catatonic state in the back of a stranger's vehicle. She did not know who or where she was. The next day, Jacoba, the mother of the family, was found aimlessly wandering in the town of Yass, 217 miles away from her last known location. It is unclear how she arrived there and at which point she left her husband. Jacoba was found in a delusional, agitated, and confused state. She and her daughter Rihanna were both taken into psychiatric care. As public interest grew, Mitchell and Ella were both interviewed on live TV, where they attempted to explain what had happened to their family and spoke about their missing father. Can you shine any light on or perhaps explain why he may not want to be found? Because he's, he's scared that people are after him. He's, he's not in a good state of mind and start off on this trip, I think it's just quite a confusing story. It is very confusing. I still feel confused. Um, it's, I think our state of minds wasn't in the best place. Um, and yeah, I, it's I hard to explain. Really, yeah. it's, it's, it's There's no bizarre, one but... reason for it. It's yeah, bizarre, yeah. <laughs> On the sixth day of the ordeal, Mark Trump was finally found near Wangaratta Airport after seemingly traveling over 900 miles in total and was taken to the local police station. He didn't appear to appreciate the media attention and offered the middle finger to photographers and reporters. Investigators can find no reason why the family felt the need to flee from their home. No drugs were involved and no previous history of mental illness has been discovered. Theories ranging from chemical poisoning to stress in the family to toxins in the water or even just a hoax have been put forward. Some are also suspecting that the bizarre incident could be a rare case of foilie à placer, which in English is translated as the madness of many. This disorder can be responsible for close-knit families sharing a heightened delusion of paranoia or fear. Although this is only speculation, and the real reason for their actions and their apparent need to escape is yet to be discovered. On December 13, 2009, 30-year-old Stephen Kocher went missing from Henderson, Nevada. A clean-cut, well-respected, church-going man, Stephen decided to take an unexplainable road trip from his home in the state of Utah to his final destination of Nevada. Stephen's car was found in a dead-end cul-de-sac, and he was shortly reported missing. Surveillance footage shows him parking his car, leaving it there, and walking out of the frame. In this footage, he is alone and appears to be walking as if he has a destination in mind. When his car was discovered, some of his belongings were still inside, including Christmas presents which he had purchased a few days prior, as well as blankets and pillows. 
Items missing from the car included Stephen's cell phone, wallet, passport, and driving license. For two days after his disappearance, his cell phone signal was picked up by a signal tower several miles from his car. It is unknown why Stephen was making cell phone calls near this tower, where exactly he was, and if it was indeed Stephen making these calls. His family are unsure why he left Utah, with no apparent cause for his disappearance other than some financial concerns. Some have speculated that Stephen may have gone to Nevada to look for a job or to hand out flyers to advertise a window washing business. Stephen is a devout Mormon, and due to his religious beliefs, he does not drink alcohol or take any drugs. Suicide is not suspected, and no sign of foul play has ever been discovered. The case remains open and is still unsolved. Fourteen-year-old Andrew Gosden went missing on September 14, 2007, and was last seen by his parents leaving home early for school. The teenager, who was described as a maths genius by his teachers, was very intelligent and was into the goth scene. On the morning of his disappearance, instead of going to school, Andrew returned to his home in Doncaster, England, knowing that his parents had left for work. He then changed out of his uniform, emptied his savings account of its 200 pound contents, and bought a one-way ticket to London. Andrew, when offered, refused to buy a round-trip ticket despite it costing only 50 pence more. This refusal would seem to imply that the 14-year-old never planned on returning. An eyewitness on the train reported that Andrew was playing on his PSP console for the duration of the journey. Strangely, however, investigators later discovered that he did not take his PSP charger with him on the trip. This CCTV footage shows Andrew as he walked into London King's Cross Station at around 11.20 a.m., over 150 miles from his hometown, and the last time he was seen alive. Andrew's family have no idea of his potential motive for traveling to London. There's been no subsequent sightings of him, and all search efforts have led to no results, with TV, radio, and internet campaigns also proving futile. His parents have since added money to his bank account in the hopes of detecting him, but this money has never been used or withdrawn. Many believe that Andrew may have traveled to London to make a fresh start. However, 100 pounds was found untouched in his bedroom, which weakens that theory. Some have pointed out that when freezing the security camera footage, a reflection of a man can be seen in the glass who appears to be looking in Andrew's direction. Was this person someone the schoolboy had planned on meeting? Perhaps, most strangely of all, a few years after the teen went missing, a visitor to a police station claimed to have information on the case, but because the station was closed, this man was asked to return the following day. However, he never did. The search for Andrew continues. On August 9, 2013, 26-year-old Brandon Lawson went missing from his car on Highway 277 near Bronte, Texas. After getting into an argument with his girlfriend, Brandon left his home just before midnight before calling his brother a short while later to report that he had run out of gas. When his brother arrived at the stated location, Brandon was no longer in his car, the vehicle had no damage, and his phone and keys were gone. In addition to calling his brother, Brandon also had contacted 911. In this mysterious and unclear phone call, Brandon breathlessly and fearfully asked the police to please hurry, and seemed to utter the words, We're not talking to them. From this exchange, it's pretty safe to say Brandon was with someone else, but it is impossible to know who and what the statement meant. What is clear, however, is that he sounds very desperate and incredibly scared. 9, 2, 13, 0, 50, and 38 seconds. 911 emergency. Yes, I'm in the middle of the field. The state we're just pushing guys over. Right here going towards Javelin on both sides. My truck ran out of gas. There's one car here. You gotta take it to the woods. Please hurry. Okay, now run that by me. No, we're not talking to him. Hi, so you ran into him. Ah, you ran into him. Okay. That's the first guy. Do you need an ambulance? No, I need the cops. Okay. Is anybody hurt? 
Hello? 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 Although Brandon's 911 call is very hard to understand, repeated listens seems to imply that some unidentified people were trying to take him into the woods, though this speculation cannot be confirmed. After arriving at the abandoned vehicle, Brandon's brother's girlfriend decided to give him a call and was told by Brandon that he was 10 minutes up the road and mentioned that he was bleeding. This was the last time they ever heard from him. Brandon's family and friends are unable to guess what happened that night, and all speculation has been fruitless. The 29-year-old has four children and a girlfriend, and no apparent motive to run away. No trace of Brandon has since been found. From June 12th to June 16th, 2009, a mysterious elderly man with a heavy Germanic accent visited the coastal town of Sligo in Ireland, where he spent his final days. The man checked himself into the Sligo City Hotel, under the name Peter Bergman, and paid for his stay in cash. On June 16th, the body of this enigmatic man was found on a beach under very mysterious circumstances. Investigators looked at all available CCTV footage in an attempt to work out what had happened to him. They noticed that when Bergman left the hotel each morning, he was carrying a disposable plastic bag. He would then return later in the day, seemingly without this bag. It is believed that he was gradually and carefully disposing of his personal belongings, though no evidence has ever been found. On the second morning of his stay, the man visited the local post office where he purchased eight postage stamps and airmail stickers. Presumably, this means that he sent out several letters in the post, most likely to friends and family, but this is only speculation. The CCTV footage assembled from the case shows a great deal of the man's comings and goings inside the hotel and around the town. However, no footage exists of the moments in which he disposed of the contents in his purple bag. Investigators believe that by meticulously and intentionally avoiding cameras during these key moments, the man was attempting to hide his actions and decrease the chances of his disposed belongings ever being found. It is unknown why this man seemed so intent on permanently hiding his identity, though it is clear that this was very important to him. The real mystery began when the investigators uncovered that the name Peter Bergman was an alias, as there is no record of anyone in the same age bracket or description possessing this name anywhere. On his final day in Sligo, the man checked out of the hotel with his purple plastic bag and two more black bags. He then walked to the bus station where he is spotted on CCTV carrying only two bags. The man goes inside the coffee shop and can be seen in the footage pulling out a piece of paper and reading it before tearing it up. He then took a bus to the beach of Ross's Point. Many witnesses saw him and reported that he was pacing up and down the beach and seemed to be behaving strangely. It is at this beach that his body was later found. Bizarrely, the mysterious man had removed all labels from his clothing and had no wallet, money, or any forms of identification on his person. An autopsy was performed and determined that there were no signs of foul play and no signs of saltwater drowning. Further examination showed that the man had extensive prostate cancer and numerous bone tumors. But despite his bad health, the toxicology report showed that there were no drugs, including painkillers, in his system, which meant he would have been in a significant amount of pain. The most accepted theory is that the man traveled to Ireland and decided to take his own life. However, despite further investigations, police are completely unable to discover who this man was, how he died, and the reasons for his mysterious actions.